Here's the layout of my today's talk. I'll start by giving you a brief background to bioeconomy. What is it really? We've been hearing about this buzzwords, buzz concepts now recently. Bioeconomy, circular economy, circular bioeconomy, blue bioeconomy. So I'll try to clarify some of those concepts. And even when we talk about bioeconomy, do we have a common shared vision when it comes to bioeconomy? After that, I'll try to speak about the benefits and the potential negative outcomes of a bioeconomy if we don't handle that properly. And I'll also try to summarize some of the key criteria that we need for transition to a sustainable bioeconomy. And before my concluding remarks, I'll also try to say a few words about the Bioeconomy Graduate Research School that we recently initiated here at Lund University. Right, the first time widely used definition of bioeconomy, it came actually with this OECD report from 2009, where it clearly highlighted the importance of biotechnology. So how biotechnology, the application and the advancement of biotechnology to primary production, health, industry could result in emerging bioeconomy, while it contributes a significant share of the economic output. So the biotechnology, both in the production of biomass phase, all the uh, breeding technology, the GM, etc., as well as the processing part of the biomass, the industrial biotechnology. If you look at the EU definition of uh, bioeconomy from the EU bioeconomy strategy from 2012, it says that it's an economy that encompasses the production of renewable biological resources. And what are these resources? It's the resources that we get from agriculture, forestry, and marine. And the marine part is the blue bioeconomy, just to in parentheses. So the production of these renewable biological resources and then conversion them, as well as the all waste streams, into value-added products, such as food, biomaterials, bioenergy, and other bioproducts. Uh, more specifically, maybe, how can we produce biofuel and energy from agricultural crops, for wood residues, forest residues, from algae, from organic waste? Uh, how can we use woods in construction or in textile with wood fibers, for instance? The bioplastic that we can make from organic waste or from crops, etc., and pharmaceuticals from algae, for instance, just to highlight some of the few examples. Uh, this map shows the bioeconomy policies around the world. The dark colors, dark green colors that you see, they are the countries which have a dedicated bioeconomy strategy at the national level. If you look at Europe, you see Finland, Germany, France, Spain, and most recent Italy. They have a dedicated national bioeconomy strategy and action plans. And then slightly lighter green countries that you see, they don't have a dedicated strategy, but strategies that are related, very strongly related to bioeconomy, such as Sweden. And I think we'll hear about that in the morning as well. And in, again, if I have to focus on the European bioeconomy uh, strategies, in addition to the member states' national strategies, now in the regions there are strategies and action plans popping up, such as we'll also, I think, hear about the SCONA, the Region SCONA's Bioeconomy Strategy and Action Plan already in the morning session as well. So there's a discussion in Europe now whether they should go for a revision for the strategy because of all these feedbacks that is coming from the national as well as regional uh, strategies, bioeconomy strategies. And when it comes to the, the vision that we're talking about, a most recent study, one of the co-authors actually is a part of the Graduate Research School and here in Lund, TACE, uh, they looked at almost 450 different uh, scientific articles to identify the, inter the key interpretations of the bioeconomy concepts. What the study came up with is there are basically three different visions. The most a uh, common one is the biotechnology vision. It emphasized the importance of the biotechnology research and application and commercialization of biotechnology in different sectors. So clearly there's a 
great focus on the economic growth and the job creation and the application of such bioeconomies on the global clusters and central regions. The second most common vision in these studies was the bioresource vision, and it focuses on the role of R&D R &D, related to the biological raw materials as well as on the establishment of new value chains. Again, the economic growth is in the main focus area, but within the sustainability criteria. And it can be applied well, on I the rural to peripheral time. regions. And the first vision, which is not that common as compared it's to the other four. two, it's the one that highlights the importance of the ecological processes <laughs> that optimize the use of energy and Yelling nutrients, to promote the biodiversity and avoid the monocultures and soil degradation. So clearly the focus is on the conservation of the ecosystems and, of course, the sustainability. So even though this study says that this is not maybe focusing very much on the economic, the job creation, but I think there's great potential there as well, especially because, because the, the development of locally embedded uh, economies we're talking about in this vision. Yes, bioeconomy has tremendous potential for growth and substantial benefits to the society and environment if it's done properly. It can address the key environmental challenges such as the climate change. It can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions simply by reducing the use of fossil-based raw materials. So if we replace all fossil-based fuel, petrochemicals used in chemicals and all the plastic, oil-based plastic, all the textile products that is heavily dependent on petrochemicals such as polyester, so simply just shifting from oil-based to bio gives us this reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. And maybe here I have to also mention that the use of wood, for instance, in construction industry, which is very heavily dominated by cement production, which is a great emitter, CO2 emitter to the atmosphere, there's big potentials there as well. Uh, and then we can reduce the pressure on the environment simply by replacing the non-degradable materials with degradable, the bio ones. We can diversify our energy resources, which results in an improved energy security, supply of energy security. The bioeconomy can provide the healthier and longer lives with all bioproducts. And of course, the whole new business areas across the whole biomass value chain. All the way in the production phase of the biomass, increasing the multifunctionality and scope of agriculture and forestry sector, in the processing part by with, with the new technology and manufacturing of these new value-added products, valuization of these waste streams. So there's a huge potential there as well. Uh, just to give you an example, for instance, today the increase in bioplastic production is around 13%. And if this trend continues to 2030, then we're talking about the production in, in four times increase in the production, which may result in like 300 new biorefineries all across Europe with an investment of 47 billion euro. And clearly there's socioeconomic implications of that, increased employment and stimulating the regional development. So there are quite many potential for growth and socioeconomic benefits, environmental benefits. Here is a picture showing the global biomass demand. It's from 2011, but it should be the same for now. You can see that almost 60% of the global biomass demand is in the form of feed. And then another almost 15% is in the form of food. So in total, almost 75% of globally produced biomass, the demand for that is in food and feed. And the remaining is 10, 15% bioenergy, 10% material use, and then only 1% for biofuels. So how will the future biomass would look like? Clearly, there is this increasing demand already that we've seen so far. It will continue. And not only as food and feed, but as other materials, such as the, all the fibers and feedstock for the fuel and energy as well. 
If you just look at the field, for instance, a recent report by, um, I think, Austrian Environmental Economics and uh, Friends of the Earth, Europe, it says that the future demand for biofuels, the production is expected to expand rapidly to 120, 180 million hectares of cropland. And this is just for non-food use of biomass. If you look at the other materials, not for fuel, and then we also expect specifically for just plastics, by year 2019, we expect a triple increase in the production. And that is equivalent to almost like 300,000 hectares of crop. You need that much space to produce this biomass to be used for just for bioplastics. So this is just non-food demand that we're talking about. When it comes to all biomass demand, if we consider the ever-increasing global population, if you consider the changing consumption patterns, simply because of these changes in the demography worldwide, like in 2000, by 2030, we expect an additional two to five billion middle-class consumers, and mainly in the Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So what if all these consumers try to eat, want to eat more meat? So clearly, bioeconomy may also generate severe negative impacts on the environment and the social economy. Some of them are conversion of the ecologically fragile and valuable lands to agriculture to produce this biomass that we need. And associated that, the conflicts for land, the possible CO2 emissions from such conversions. If we intensify, it's not that we can clear cut our forests and cause deforestation in all parts of the world, simply because of regulations and legislations, but there will be some areas where we will try to intensify our production, both in agriculture and production. And that may have result in depleted and contaminated water resources with increased nutrition use, uh, nutrients use, loss of biodiversity, both above and maybe more importantly below ground. So all ecosystem functioning, if we destroy that ecosystem functioning, how are we going to cope with producing that much biomass that we will be looking in the future because of the simply decreased soil fertility? <coughs> food security is an issue. Shall we use this biomass for material production or food and feed production? And maybe more specifically, all the recent discussions around the bioplastic, there's this clear standards defining their recyclability, biodegradability and composability. There are still some issues around that that we need to have a look closer. So what do we need, actually? We need a systems level redesign of the existing economic system and the socio-ecological regime. What does that mean? We need to produce our biomass sustainably so that it should sustain, not reduces the life support mechanism of the planet Earth. That means that we need to start talking about valuing our natural capital. We need to look at the ecosystem services, not only the, the, the ones that we can measure and put a monetary value on that, but the others, the biodiversity such as, we need to start talking about that. I think this is really missing at the moment too much uh, in bioeconomy discussions. Of course, we need innovation. And when I speak about innovation, it's not only technological innovation. We need to have innovation in new business systems. We need to innovation in product design. We need to have innovation in legal frameworks. We need an innovative institutional structure that can handle the policy and the legal frameworks. So this new institutional arrangement, they should interlink this independently address policies from different many sectors all across the bioeconomy, uh, all across the biomass value chain. We need to change our consumption patterns. We can't simply continue the, the way we consume. Otherwise, we just sh shift from oil-based to bio-based and then empty our bio-resources as well. Then they are not renewable anymore. So we really need to think properly. And if we want this societal acceptance, the broader societal acceptance of this bioeconomy, we have a really we need to have a good narrative where we address all these issues. And maybe especially addressing most of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So here we're talking about uh, really a paradigm shift. 
Is it an easy task? No, definitely not. I mean, agreeing on legal frameworks, formulating policies and measures, industrial investment to prepare that uh, arena for them, and achieving this, this societal, broader societal acceptance, definitely not an easy task. It's complex and dynamic, changing all the time. So if we look at all the environmental, economic, social, technological, political, and legal aspects in this big picture, then the system solutions that we need has to be transdisciplinary. It certainly requires cross-sectoral collaboration with the engagement of all stakeholders representative from these sectors. And clearly, we need a systems thinking approach to see the big picture and interconnectedness in this big field of bioeconomy. And of course, innovation is a very important part of the whole process. So that's why we started this uh, bioeconomy graduate research school at Lund University with an ultimate aim of developing these competencies necessary for the PhD student, this graduate research school, to adapt the systemic approach and lead the way in transdisciplinary research. So, in fact, more specifically, the whole economic, the Bioeconomy Graduate Research School is a collaborative learning platform with researchers from different backgrounds, with PhDs from different backgrounds, and in close collaboration with outside the academia work with all stakeholder representative from the whole biomass value chain. The founder of the school is FORMAS, as well as the other public-private organizations, such as SCONA, Malmostad, Medicum Village, Landman, and, and Perstorp, Bona, and World Energy Associ Bioenergy Association. As I said, we're the partners of the school. They're from three faculties, from four centers at Lund University, and five departments from physical, geography, ecosystem science to biology, chemical engineering, biotechnology, sociology, and political science. Every year, we aim to give this educational and training uh, activities to 20 PhDs with uh, courses and seminars and the other workshops that we plan. So if there are any PhD students in the public today, I strongly encourage you to have a look at our website. Uh, there are still, we're expecting still uh, applications for this year. So please have a look at that. And in case if the things need to be clarified, you can find me outside here today all day, or I'm happy to take any questions. So if I have to conclude, this is the circular bioeconomy the vision we have in the Graduate Research School. We need to synthesize these three visions that I spoke earlier. Here is the biomass, I'm sorry about the quality of the <laughs> uh, picture, but here is the biomass resources from forestry, agriculture, and marine. It's supplied as either food and feed and biomass feedstock in different forms from starch to mixed biomass that can be processed by different refinery, all different technologies, to produce the bio-based food and feed, as well as the uh, products and energy and fuel. And from all the way from pharmaceuticals to fine chemicals to surfactants, lubricants, all the way to construction and construction material and biofuel. So that it can be consumed in different sectors, but throughout this phase, I don't want to call it biomass value chain because now we're talking about biomass value circles. We need to have the circular economy part. So we need to keep the resources in the production, supply, use phase as much we can with high value. That's why all waste streams that happens in this circle should be, I mean, this is in the form of side streams, all the byproducts. We need to find innovative ways of reusing them in a cascade way and then recycling them so that we don't lose the waste. And then whatever we can't use, we make sure that all the nutrients and minerals in that goes back to the biomass production. And of course, 
someone has to plan, oops, sorry about this, you can't see, but it says planning, coordination and governance of the transition to circular bioeconomy, then we need the systems approach, we need transdisciplinarity, we need cross-collaboration, cross-sectoral collaborations, we need all the things, the uh, criteria that I already talked about, the legal frameworks, the innovation, integrated policies, the broader uh, societal acceptance. And of course, if we're talking about a transition to a bioeconomy, we need to know how well or bad we perform in that. So we need bioeconomy indicators to measure that. And it's not an easy task, but when it comes to the working methodology, I will not go deep into that because there's no much time left. But uh, we, what we call is system science-based and stakeholder participatory group modeling process, where we model the whole big, this complex and dynamic system together with the stakeholders, with a set of uh, workshops together. This is what we intend to do in the graduate research school. Uh, so you, we conceptually model that thing, we make a proper systemic analysis of this situation, and then we develop numerical models, systems dynamics models, for integrated scenario analysis, and this can be a decision support tool for the user, policymakers or decision makers, to test alternative scenarios for the future. And here I think I'll end my talk, which is, I hope, in time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. This is a microphone. I don't, know if, I don't know if you've encountered this one before. It's called Catch the Box. And uh, at the, with this, I will try to see if I still have the skills of uh, my former career as a basketball player. Because whoever wants to pose a question, I will toss the microphone to you. And then you will catch it and speak into the round black circle in the middle. All right? OK. Just warm up a bit, think what you uh, would like to, to ask, and I'll start asking you, Dennis. Um, in Sweden, we have uh, we like to be forerunners, frontrunners. We like to be uh, ahead when it comes to sustainable development. We like to be put on the nice leader T-shirt and sort of show the way to for other countries. But when you show the, the initial slides here with the paler green for mm -hmm. Sweden uh, versus, for instance, United States, that mm -hmm. didn't feel so good. So in terms of us being able to get ahead and be a leader also in this field for many reasons. How do you, how do you look at that? Uh, that picture, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you don't have a national level dedicated bioeconomy strategy, if you don't have this, you don't do much in bioeconomy field. Ah. It doesn't say that because in Sweden, even though it's not dedicated, we have very strongly mm. purely bioeconomy related strategies. So in that sense, I'm not worried at all. Mm. Uh, maybe we can discuss over the day, but what I'm worried more about the discussions only talking about forestry based mm -hmm. bioeconomy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I mean, forestry is Sweden, that's what the resources mainly we have, but there are many other ways of mm. doing, making the bioeconomy work. Mm. So, such as the agriculture, marine, and other waste streams. So, so if, if you would look at Sweden from an international perspective, are we. Uh, it's coming, it's definitely coming, but. Maybe it's not like Finland or Germany or the Netherlands mm. yet, but mm. for, in for I mean with my knowledge, with my... And uh, with your program, it will be better. Hopefully. <laughs> we'll Excellent. just try to contribute to our best if mm. there is any way that we can contribute. Mm -hmm. Hands up for whoever wants to catch the microphone. Don't be shy now. If you don't want it to be... Oh, all the way in the back. That was a, that was a crazy one, and then I have to walk. <laughs> That's... I don't think I can reach that far any longer. <laughs> Let's see. Would you like to stand up, sir? See if you can catch it. Here you go. I'm daring it. Here we go. Whoa, whoops. <laughs> Almost. Please state your name and where you're from, please, before you ask your question. OK, uh, the name is uh, Ivo uh, Achunges, uh, Biotechnology. So uh, I've been a student here at Lund University for a few years now. I'm uh, unemployed. but. Uh, Actually, in one of your, one of your first uh, slides, uh, you, I mean, in one uh, of those pie charts, you mentioned about the use of biomass and uh, some sort of uh, bioenergy and biofuels. So I don't know what's the difference between those two, if there's any big uh, line of demarcation between those. You mean this slide? Yeah, th yes, that one. 
and you again have bioenergy and biofuel so uh, what's the difference between uh, okay biofuels it's the like bioethanol biodiesel and bioenergy is mostly like burning the biomass in different forms to get the energy out of that of course they, i mean it can be combined it's not like two different things but this is worldwide and if i know it right the bioenergy it's mostly the third world using wood directly to in the kitchen or for heating purposes okay, thank you yeah thank you another taker here would like to ask a question here we go that was easy okay can you hear me yeah <laughs> um yes uh, thanks dennis for your talk it was really interesting and that you ended with trying to sort of integrate it all into one uh, one figure but i was wondering in terms of the um, in terms of the integration of the um, of of the of the knowledge and on the ongoing dynamics are there any sort of feedback loops that integrate all these complex different things i mean we're seeing um an intergovernmental panel on um climate change, um, biodiversity, and ecosystem services, are there any sort of initiatives to try and sort of understand what's going on uh, and maybe have some form of checks and balances to, um, to ensure that these three visions um, sort of are uh, represented uh, in a proper way? Because mm. you can, of course, governance is very different uh, from one country uh, to the next, and global governance is always a major challenge, and increasingly so, maybe. Um, so I do see some some challenges also related Question to the bioeconomy. Question, please. Bio okay, yeah, definitely. And this is, at the moment, I would say lacking. So we definitely need this, all these feedbacks, and this is why we put the systems approach, which is all about looking at the big system and what are the components in that system and how they interlink to each other, what are the cause-effect relationship between those things. So this is what we're after. And of course, it's not an easy task, and at the moment, maybe we don't have it, a well-functioning system on that end, but this is exactly what we want to achieve. We want to know how much biomass we can sustainably and in a responsible way we can produce. And we want to know how much in the future we need biomass for all different... F is, do we need that to use it for food and feed? Do we need it for all the material, all the products that we're talking about, biobased products? So we want to know all this. So if we want to come up with a proper narrative telling us this is the way we want to do it, we, we definitely need all the feedbacks from that's what you just Thank uh, you. mentioned. Here you go. Close to your face, please, and state your mm -hmm. name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Ruja Nasvedelius, and my background is plant nutrients recycling research. And if you do that, you need also know about bioenergy because it's connected very closely. And I tried to get definition on bioenergy. And I made my own definition because if we talk about energy, it can't be destroyed, it can't be produced, it can be only transformed. So my definition is only mine, that uh, sun's energy is transforming during photosynthesis to become bioenergy in plant biomass as that we use as food, feed, fiber. And in these three is always this bioenergy. And, um, and your question would be for the my speaker, please? My question is if we can use this <laughs> definition, because that is really energy definition, actually. Somebody so you, like it or not? <laughs> so your question is, would your definition yeah. be, be able to be used in research? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, of course, why not? I mean, that's the... And uh, th there are so much research, a very hot topic nowadays, it's the, the, the artificial photosynthesis. So 
I think I'm not an expert on that end, but what you just said that the the energy, bioenergy on the plant, on the, the production of the biomass side is, yeah, I, I mean, it's a definition that we can use. But then I think there's other, um, on the processing part of the biomass as well, we're talking about the energy. That, that energy is transferred in other forms at that end as well. So it's not only the production of the biomass we're talking about. Thank you. We have time for one more question. All right. Here you go. You got it. It's a soft one, so don't worry. It won't, it will hit anybody. Nobody will be Thank injured. Uh, Francisco Valas, I work uh, with sustainability at Tetra Pak. Uh, you had a very good slide on the future perspective in um, uh, uh, European Union with biorefineries, what the investments were going to be in 2030. Yeah. Uh, so, so my question would be, do you know more or less what the feedstock will be for uh, that uh, type of industry uh, increase? So if we know if it's going to be forestry, um, agriculture, uh, this is some indication already. Uh, I don't know the details of this study, but I can imagine it's a mix of all. It's not only agriculture, not only forestry, and not only waste streams, not only marine, but combination of all resources. Okay. Yep. Any, s any specific incentives in some area that we think will grow a bit more? Or oh, I don't know, to be okay. honest. A mixed. Yeah. Mm, thanks. Thank you. But when it comes thanks. to forestry, I mean, this is European figures, so... We can't expect an increase in forestry in Europe. Well, in the product, I mean, in terms of land, and same thing for agriculture. So mostly we're talking about either intensification of both forestry and agriculture, or finding all the side streams, all the byproducts, all the waste streams that we can potentially use. Thank you, Dennis. I have a final question. Uh, Earth Overshoot Day, uh, the day when we have uh, used uh, so many resources that we actually have taken out too much from the, from the planet. Uh, it comes earlier every year. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was in August this year that we actually have been sort of taking out in our lifestyle, our collective life lifestyle on the planet. Um, from your perspective as a researcher, when do you see that sort of pulling back back into the right, I mean, when we actually make a full year before we deplete the resources. Can you give us a sort of a timeline when that would be a turnaround for that? Uh, I can't give you a timeline I know for you that, can't, unfortunately. But you, could, you, could, you could give but us a, a good guess. Uh, I, my main research is actually looking at the global resources, modeling the supply of global resources, both abiotic and biotic, and mainly abiotic, all the key technological metals for today's industry, etc., mm, etc. Mm. Et I will not go deep into that, all energy resources. But we have seen peak resources in many of the individual resources. Mm. So every year we produce less and less as compared to the previous years. And this will happen in the future in many other individual resources as well. Within this century, we will see peak of many resources that we need for running the mm. whole economy and today's technology. So in that sense, this is why we're talking about mm. circular economy. This is why we're talking about shifting from oil to bio-based economy. So yeah, I mean, within this century, uh, I would expect things will happen. So we need to start planning properly mm -hmm. to use efficiently something, but sufficiently the resources that we have and how we can like keep them in the economy, in the production and consumption cycle as much we can with high values. This is the key. And also we have to change our behavior. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can, it's a closed system in the end with limited resources. Mm -hmm. So we can't have this exponential increase mm -hmm. in population and exponential mm -hmm. increase mm -hmm. in individual consumptions. So both combined, then we have the depletion of resources mm -hmm. and potential scarcity in certain resources. Mm -hmm. So we definitely need to reduce our consumption. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Dennis. Thank Kocha. you. A warm hand for Dennis. <laughs>